Okay, live here from the NFL Combine, the voice is making a strong, strong comeback. Uh, it is, I don't even know what day it is, Wednesday, Wednesday, it's Wednesday here at the Combine. Just uh, was BSing with Florio over there. We'll hopefully uh, talk to him a little bit later. And uh, yesterday was awesome. A lot of coaches running through. But one thing I didn't get a chance to do is kind of discuss all the stories. You know, when you're talking to, you know, Super Bowl champions, you don't realize all the stuff kind of coming out. You get home to your hotel room, you know, late at night, you grab a quick bite, all of a sudden you realize, God, there was a lot of stories flying around. And and I got opinions and I got thoughts on all those stories, but I kind of missed them throughout the day where if I was just in my office, I I would have been all over them. So uh, I wanted to hit kind of rapid fire on some of the bigger stories so far uh, that have come out of the combine because obviously the coaches and a lot of GMs talked and reporters are just on the grind. Big J's doing Big J stuff. So uh, I wanted to go rapid fire through that and obviously subscribe to the podcast. You guys know the deal. But before we dive in to everything, here's what I need you to do. I need you to grab your smartphone. I need you to grab your iPad and I need you to download a little app. It happens to be the official ticketing app of this podcast, and they go by game time. I've been a loyal user for a long time. I'm actually in a, I think, is it next week? I'm going to a spring training game. Why? Because of game time. I downloaded that app, bought some tickets for my family, and we're going to go watch Shohei Otani hit like seven home runs in a spring training game against some double-A pitcher. So I am very, very excited. If you want to do that, come to Arizona, come to Florida. Obviously, NBA, the playoffs are right around the corner. NCAA tournament. There's nothing like that first round if it's coming to a city near you. Highly recommend it. Download the Game Time app. Promo code John. Promo code John. J-O-H-N. $20 off. Highly recommend. Okay, let's start with the biggest story of the day. And I don't even think it's close. And I I think it's pretty clear from just keeping my ear, uh, talking to people in the league, obviously just knowing people that talk to people around the organization and watching Florio and, or excuse me, polls and Eberflus talk. Justin Fields is done and he's been done since last year. It's over. He's going to be on another team. Caleb Williams is going to be drafted by him. Like this is no longer, it's technically still a story because it's, it hasn't become unofficial yet. It can't even become official till March 11th, but he's not going to be the quarterback of the bears. And honestly, that was probably determined the moment Carolina was a lock to get the number one pick. And Ryan Poles, I'm sure, has a couple trades that he would like a do-over on. He's also had some really good trades. Uh, But that trade with the Carolina Panthers has a chance to be one of the great fleecings of all time. Let's, Let's be real. I mean, the Carolina Panthers now have a quarterback that weighs 165 pounds whose team sucks on his second coach. Like, they got problems. But... The Chicago Bears now have a chance to take Caleb Williams. And I would imagine a lot of people think that Justin Fields is going to be on the Chicago or the Atlanta Falcons. I don't know. There are several teams. But I do think when you look at the landscape of this is the (coughs) – sorry, I'm I'm battling here – is the question with the Fields' compensation is we have some recent examples of Sam Darnold who got traded – and they picked up his fifth-year option for a second-round pick, and they immediately regretted it. Baker Mayfield had his fifth-year option picked up by the Browns, and then they had to eat the money to trade him. These are complicated situations because this is a business. This isn't fantasy fucking football here. So when you trade for Justin Fields, you have to go, well, am I going to pick up his contract? I have some people think that they will try to do one of those Jordan Love-type extensions at a lower number. Uh, I I just know these situations are complicated. We've seen them. So you almost have to believe, if you're going to trade a second-round pick in Justin Fields, that you can resurrect his career into at least a really solid player. Like right now, he's a runner who can kind of have some explosive passes outside the construct of the offense, but he can't throw within the pocket. And that's a problem in the NFL. But, you know, and they're going to bet on Caleb Williams, which I've said over and over. He's a legitimate prospect. But being a great prospect does not mean you're a great player. So you go to the Bears, who it's been well-documented, have struggled at the quarterback position, struggled at the offensive, just overall operation most of my life. So that there's going to be a lot of pressure on that. But Caleb Williams is going to be a Bear. Then the other question. 
Who goes number two? And, and I think that is definitely up in the air. And I, I think that is the biggest question going into the draft. Caleb Williams going one. Is it Drake May or Jaden Daniels? And then once that guy goes two, the other guy is going three. So I, I, I think all eyes point to the Washington Commanders, who Adam Peters, who might have the best hair here in the NFL, and um, Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury. Some people think that there's a chance that they go Jaden Daniels, more of a spread quarterback, big-time athlete, kind of of the mold of Kyler. And then I've talked to other people that the moment Drake May walks into one of these rooms and you just see his size and his potential, because a like, lot like Caleb Williams, you're a prospect. These teams don't view, even Lincoln Riley, like we view we're better than you at our job than you are. Fair or not. Right, so I, I think the whole thing with this number two is about projecting. It's not about year one, it's about five years from now, right? The Bills did this once upon a time with Josh Allen. The Chief, obviously there are a lot of positive examples, there are also ones that go the other way. This isn't an exact science. There's no guarantee, you're dealing with human beings, not widgets. So uh, watching who's gonna go number two and number three, I, like I've said, I, I haven't watched Jaden Daniels enough to have like a concrete opinion. And when I did watch Drake May during the middle of the season, I didn't see it. But I, I, I know football and the draft isn't all about at quarterback, like who are you playing with? Who's coaching you? Um, I'm not trying to make excuses for the guy, but he might just not be good. But he, he's definitely a good prospect when you factor in. Part of being a prospect is the measurables, the movement, the athleticism, the arm strength. Uh, Jaden has that, right? Big-time athlete, good arm. Like the one thing with Jaden I think a lot of people wonder is you go, well, this guy played with two wide receivers who are going to go in the top 15. So that, that's a fair question. Like he's going to go to a team that probably does not have that. Now, the commanders actually have some skill guys, but I'm fascinated how this all plays out. And, uh, right, the Bears have the same administration from last year where you look at the commanders – brand new people you look at new england obviously brand new people gonna be very very fascinating other thing that's clearly out there is someone's gonna get traded if not multiple guys are gonna get traded and t higgins brandon Ayuk, uh the chiefs are they gonna tag and trade one of these guys y you can't pay everybody even with the cap going up I, I saw john schneider said yesterday he thought the cap was like 248 249 so he was thrilled when he got that extra six seven million dollars you know, when, when the cap came out at $255 million. And listen, you can manipulate the cap. It, it's not like this isn't basketball where every guy's exact number hits the cap. You, you know, you push it back like a credit card. But when you start hearing numbers like $28 million for T. Higgins or 25 plus for Brandon Ayuk, I've always said this about the NBA. I don't give a shit when the cap goes up or whatever. You pay premiums, the guy better be a premium. If I'm going to pay an enormous amount of money, the guy better be Travis Kelsey, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Trent Williams, Nick Bosa, TJ Watt. I don't like paying premiums for guys that like, yeah, he's a really good player. So when, when that's the case, even when you love the guy, like I, I think I, I know the Chiefs love Snead and they love Chris Jones. I know for a fact the 49ers love Brandon Ayuk. I don't know anyone with the Bengals, but pretty sure they like T. Higgins. He's fucking good. But you, th this is a business, and you have to make tough choices. So, and the Niners have a highly paid wide receiver. His name's Debo Samuel. The Bengals have a guy that they are going to pay an astronomical amount of money to in Jamar Chase. The Chiefs have a young corner who looks like the next, like Charles Woodson in, in Trent McDuffie. So, you have to make these big picture decisions. And it's easier, all these teams, you know, have had success. Obviously, the Chiefs have had the most. It's easy to make tough decisions when you're winning because you have more equity with the fans and the owner. So I think one, if not multiple, of these guys are getting traded. And I think the complicated part about these trades is, so I'm trading for a wide receiver who's a really good player. Like Brandon Ayuk, T. Higgins, they come to my team and they, they immediately make me better. They become a guy that has a chance to be a top 10 wide receiver in the NFL. But I have to give up a really high pick, right? <clears throat> I mean, I think both these teams are going to want somewhere between like 15 and the early 20s to make a trade and then I have to pay the guy 25 to 28 million dollars a year where it's like why don't I just sit in that spot and draft the best wide receiver on the board now the complicated part is 
it's hard. And I saw it with the Niners when they traded to Forrest Buckner. They traded Buckner and they got pick 13. You're like, holy shit. That is it's the best value I've ever seen. And they took Javon Kinlaw. So, like, having the value is great. And then you got to pick the player. And the Chiefs, when they traded Tyree Kill, they got Trent McDuffie. So, when you make the trade, you better get the right player. That, that's the key. So, I, I think one, some of these offers for some of these players, it's, it's going to be fascinating how it works out. But there, there's definitely going to be some movement. There's been some buzz and rumblings about Justin Jefferson. The entire point of being a football organization as a GM, as a coaching staff, as a front office – is to land players like Justin Jefferson. That's the entire job. Obviously, the number one job, find your quarterback. And then after that, find sweet players at all the main positions. And they have a guy. So I I saw Kevin O'Connell said yesterday, we haven't had internal, external, there have been no conversations. Now, I do understand. So if you're talking $25 million for Brandon Ayuk, Justin Jefferson's looking, what the fuck do you think he wants? $40-plus million a year? Could you trade them for like three ones? I mean, you entertain these ideas. This is their job. These conversations going in all these hotel rooms would blow people away. The guy's getting discussed. I mean, think about it. Who's not getting discussed this week? Probably like 15 players that never come up in a conversation, right? Mahomes, Lamar, Herbert, uh, Allen, like Trent Williams, T.J. Watt. I mean, it's a, it's a small group of players that would never get discussed. I promise you, names get thrown around constantly. Like 98% of the league is discussed. And especially when you have contractual situations with players. But I, I think when you make a decision like this to, to keep them, which they should, but as long as you don't have a quarterback, like you have to kind of leave your options open. So I, I, do, I do take them at face value to go they haven't discussed this. But people are going to ask about it. And that gets back to the thing. So I got to trade a couple ones for Justin Jefferson, and then I got to pay him, I don't know, $100 million guaranteed. These deals can be very complicated because of the financial ramifications, because of the draft capital you have to give up to give them. And it's not like they can just give him up for two picks in the 20s. I mean, he's one of the best, most talented players they've had in the last, like, 20 years. Like, Adrian Peterson, I mean, Randy Moss, like, he's that level of – You know, physical talent. Now, I'm not saying he's going to have the career. He's got to stay healthy. But these situations are complicated. Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 back in a bonus bet. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JOHN. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code J-O-H-N. The crown is yours. I I think the Russell Wilson situation, I'm kind of exhausted by it. Like, Russ, you've kind of sucked the last two years. Like, I I just, I I feel a little sympathy. You know, the, the media who I'm sitting around right now, just always leans on the side of the player. They're always right. You know, it's like, it's always fucked up in business. Yeah. You can ask for whatever you want. You get what you negotiate. Do do you feel sympathy because they asked him? He had the right to say, no, welcome to a negotiation. They're not always pretty. Listen, are the Broncos right? Is he right? End of the day, he's been stealing for two years, right? Now you can argue he earned that contract with Seattle. That's fine. The Broncos, and they made a massive mistake by signing it. But like, once you sign a huge contract, it's, it's the same in any business. Why, why are we having like a commercial real estate falling apart all over major cities in America? Because they had signed these huge contracts and then all these people left. And now they're like at a fork in the road. The value of the building's down. These situations get complicated when you talk a lot of money. Most situations in the NFL are not that complicated. Why? Because they don't have the amount of guaranteed money that quarterbacks have. So when a guy sucks for a couple of years, you just cut him. You just move on. Eat a little dead money. The quarterback situations can be complicated because you guarantee NBA, Major League Baseball level money to them. As long as the guy's good, no one gives a shit, right? Lamar Jackson, they pay him a bunch of money. and he, He's good. You don't even think twice. Patrick Mahomes, they gave him $450 million. Josh Allen, they gave him $250 million. He's awesome. Like, whatever. You, you never even crossed your mind. Well, the moment I give Russell Wilson all this money and then he plays like a bottom 15 quarterback, we're in major fucking trouble. And, and that's what, where they've been. And then you had Sean Payton, 
who when Colin talks about this a lot, like is kind of a crazy man in a good football way. Russell Wilson's like this, you know, optimistic, never, he he just said, he he just claimed he wants to win two Super Bowls in the next five years. And listen, I'm all for like positive reinforcement. That stuff works. I'm not acting like being negative Nancy 24 seven is the way to be. Andy Reid, who's dominating the NFL is a positive person. Pete Carroll is one of the most successful co- coaches for the last 20 years. Positive. I'm, I'm pro being positive. But Russell saying, I want to win two of the next five Super Bowls, like that's the level of stuff that people just laugh at him. I mean, it's like, shut up, man. Let, let's just get your career back on track. You are going to have to play next year when you're cut. Someone's going to try to sign you for the minimum. It's why the Pittsburgh Steelers make some sense. They just sign him for a million dollars. And I've also thought about this with the Steelers. What's he going to do? Go in there and act weird in front of like Cam Hayward, TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick? Like they don't really have Mike Tomlin. They, they don't really operate like that. You know, part of Pete Steele, like super optimistic. Then he gets Nathaniel Hackett, like, oh, Mr. Smiley. That, that shit, Pittsburgh is like, they, they don't play that game. So I actually think it's a positive place for him to go in the sense that he doesn't have a choice. He kind of has to just buckle down and figure it out. And if he doesn't like that, let's win three Super Bowls in the next four years. People are like, let's just win a playoff game. Can we just win a playoff game? So I think the Russ situation was inevitable. Some things are inevitable for the moment they happen, right? The moment Sean Payton came into Denver, Russ was in trouble. The moment Sam Darnold was signed with the 49ers, Trey Lance was done, right? The moment they traded for Aaron Rodgers, it was like, why are you st- kill, still keeping Zach? Well, like some things, like you just got to move on. Now they get more complicated when you have a Russell situation. Sean Payton didn't sign that contract, and he has a huge amount of money sitting there, guaranteed. And these these situations are are tough, right? And uh, he's getting cut, just like Justin Fields is getting traded. Like th- these things are happening, and you just wonder where's he going to go. I think there are a lot of people taking educated guesses, but that's what's fun about this time of year. There's a couple places that you can see him go. There's not a million. There's not like an unlimited amount of spots, right? And once those two guys take spots, if Russ is traded to Atlanta, let's, or not traded, but cut and signs there, let's just use that as hypothetical, or Justin Fields is traded there for a second round pick, then we can go, well, Atlanta's not drafting a quarterback. We don't think Pittsburgh necessarily is. Let's say New England either signs Russ or trades for Justin Fields. And we go, well, maybe they trade back. That was another thing I heard. Maybe they've been sniffing around trading back. Also heard that New England wasn't that big on Fields a couple years ago when he came out. It's weird. Like, I thought Fields was a pretty good prospect. But a lot of people in the NFL, I mean, did not like him as a prospect. They didn't think he saw it, which has kind of come to fruition in the NFL. Because part of seeing it is like rapid fire. Like you, and some guys improve on it. Like Lamar Jackson is like light years better now than he was when he first started, but he was way better immediately. I mean, I saw some people like comparing their two stats. It's like fucking watch the two guys. It's not, it wasn't close three years in. Like, well, his team, I thought Fields' team wasn't that terrible this year, but everyone tries to make excuses for him. Same thing with Russ. It's like you watch him, you know something's off. Now, these coaches have big egos, man. These coaches have a lot of belief in themselves. And now you get Arthur Smith in Pittsburgh. Do they go, we can figure this out, right? One thing I heard with the Cleveland Browns, for example, man, and I've been, I was saying this all last year, is the Browns have to figure out a way to make Deshaun Watson a solid player because his cap hit is enormous the next three years. It's like 60 plus million dollars. And I talked to someone around the Browns yesterday. And like, That's a huge emphasis here, why they tra- change their staff. It's about, we got to make Deshaun good. Because their team's not going to be as deep anymore. They, they don't have the, the capability because Deshaun's cap number is so large. So it's either Deshaun does well this year or we're going to be in trouble. And when I say does well, like not like Russell Wilson, like, oh, he looks a little better. Like, no, competes to be a Pro Bowl-level guy. Think who they're going up against in the AFC. Hell, the, I, I talked to 10 guys with the Chiefs yesterday. Around here, back at the hotel, they all said, God, the AFC's – a lot of quarterbacks. I'm like, well, yeah, you got the best one, though. It's like, yeah, the NBA's got a lot of good players. Like, well, you got Michael Jordan. So, huge advantage. It's like, yeah, they do have a lot of good quarterbacks, but when you got the best one, you always got the advantage. So, Deshaun, think of who he truly has to play better than, right? And when I, I don't mean on a weekly basis, but just be able to be, like, at least in the conversation. Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson right now in a different stratosphere. 
I think everyone with a brain is betting on Herbert to be good now that he's got Harbaugh. And, like, just that crew alone. Like, I, I was BSing with Doug Peterson yesterday. And, like, it was just a real conversation. I asked him, like, what do you think about the quarterback? And, like, without hesitation, he's like, I really like him. I think he's going to be fine. He's banged up last year. He's going to be okay. Now, I'm not as big a believer as him, and, and, and I don't think he's just saying that to say it. Like, I think he likes him. That's why he took the job. But let's just say they get him just playing at a solid level. Uh, C.J. Stroud, I didn't even think about him. Like, I mean, you just got a lot of guys. This is not going to be easy. And say what you want about Tua, his infrastructure with McDaniel, the offensive players around him, they play in a warm-weather climate. They, they got a, Burrow's coming back. You, you got to figure this out, and you got you to figure it out fast. So combine the stories that are going to come out left and right over the weekend and moving toward free agency. This is a fun time of year. I saw how he was talking to Florio yesterday, and he said that, uh, you know, as a GM, once the season gets going, like, we don't coach the team, and there are really only so many moves you can make. But a lot of stuff's out of the front office's control. Well, this time a year it's not. This is the time of year where the front office separates each other, you know, from other teams. It's like walking around here, you see people with the different logos. I'd say half the teams in the league have don't have a snowball's chance in hell to compete zero they, they, I mean they just have no shot and then you got like the next half of that 15 17 teams they're like you know if they hit on a couple guys they definitely could be playoff teams and then you got the top six or seven teams in the league that are running circles around everybody like Andy and Veach like it's not really a fair fight you got the best coach you have easily one of the best talent evaluators they know exactly like everyone thinks like the way the Ravens operate the way the Niners are operating like McVay and Les Snead you have teams that are just just on a different level. Like Sirianni's very dependent on his coordinators, but they have a high level operation. If those coordinators are good and Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio are big upgrades, even the Cowboys, like I'm not betting on them to win playoff games anymore, but they're clearly a well-run operation. A lot of these teams are not. So th this time of year, making the right decisions, GMs know what they're doing, knowing who to pay, knowing who not to pay, knowing who to trade for, who not to trade for. So much buzz in free agency about like, oh, this team has the most cap space. This team opened up this much room to pay who? Now, I like paying your own guys when you got really good young players. Extending them, it's expensive. But like other free agents, that's, that's very, very risky. They're usually free agents for a reason. And you have to pay a premium on top of that to get the guy. So it's like, well, this guy's not even an A player, but I got to pay him like an A player. It's always risky. And a lot of these guys, especially older guys, third contracts, you know, it's, most guys are not quarterbacks that play well into their mid-30s. This is the NFL. Uh, so fun times here from Indy.